We've got this panel here today, and they're going to give us an idea of what's been happening in their industries. As a wee bit of housekeeping, there is the Q&A and uh, chat box, so please use those for questions. So let's get started. Uh, I'm going to ask each panel to each panelist to introduce themselves, give a wee bit of background, and also describe in a couple of words uh, their thoughts at the end of March last year when we went into the first lockdown, and also in a, again in a couple of words their first thoughts when we went into full lockdown on Wednesday the 18th of August. Now we will try and keep those words clean. So first of all, I'll go to James. Tēnā koutou katoa ko James Aldrich uh, Tokoingoa, ko Go Rentals Tropu, ko Chief Operating Officer Tamahi, Tihei Moria. Moriora. Good morning, everybody. James Aldrich here, Chief Operating Officer at Go, at Go Rentals, and uh, looking forward to being part of the discussion today. And thanks for having us. Uh, I've been with Go for, for 20 years and have built the business up from uh, quite humble beginnings at one little centre based in Penrose and Auckland now to a, to a national rental car provider uh, in the New Zealand market. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Dan. Kia ora, everybody. Uh, my name is Dan Bidwa. I'm the Managing Director of Bidwa Strategy Group. Um, it's a small strategic advisory firm focused on uh, growth opportunities and strategy advice to typically medium to large businesses based in Auckland, but with footprints across the country. Um, I come to this discussion with many hats. Uh, firstly, as a small business owner, um, also as a former Member of Parliament for uh, Northcote, which is a urban seat in Auckland, um, and also as an economist, uh, so really a fundamental understanding of the micro and macro effects of uh, the pandemic and the impact for the wider business sector. Uh, like James, really uh, keen to uh, have this discussion. Thanks for welcoming us today and looking forward to the discussion ahead. Okay, thank you. And um, Angela. Good morning, all. Um, Angela Spackman. I'm a small to medium sized manufacturing business in Queenstown uh, joinery company, which is my day job. But I'm really here in the capacity of the chair of the Queenstown Chamber of Commerce. We're a um, very active chamber with around 600 members. So um, pretty busy down in Queenstown. Okay, thank you. And uh, Julie. Morena, everyone. Thanks again for having me as well. Um, yeah, so my name's Julie White, Chief Executive of Hospitality New Zealand. We represent close to 3,000 members. We've been uh, an association in existence for over 119 years. We have we represent food and beverage as well as accommodation. Uh, so... I'm sure it's no surprise uh, COVID has had an impact on us since the 23rd of March from the, the day that the border was shut. Um, and I think we went from a deer in headlights to where we are now um, uh, in front of a freight train is how I'd like to describe it. Um, yeah, and I look forward to talking a little bit more about the industry and what we're hearing and um, the road to recovery. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, people. I know none of you gave your uh, words of how, of how you thought about it, but I'm sure we can all uh, probably... Uh, uh, kind of assume what you were thinking at both lockdowns and probably slightly worse at this one. Anyway, let's just get started. Can we please delve into uh, starting with you, James? Can you just give us a, you know, a bit about the a bit more about the go rental story, you know, your your history, the growth, COVID, and then that now often used word pivot. Thanks, Rob. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to share those words. So certainly when COVID first hit for us, um, yeah, it, it was major. I, I describe it as uh, what, like watching a house burn to the ground. That's how I. That's my analogy for when COVID first hit back in, in March last year. And for us, our revenue tap was completely turned off at that stage. Um, in, in more recent times, heading into the second the second bout of lockdown, it was probably more along the lines of game on because we developed you know tools and mechanisms to to, to cope and and. We knew this year it was going to come again at some stage and it's always part of the plan. So we felt much better prepared to weather the storm. But that's not to say there's been some, not been some genuine challenges with the, with the longevity. But going back to a little bit of history. So Go, uh, Go was started in about 1999 
Uh, and I actually first joined the business um, in in uh, early 2001 uh, after actually being a, a Go Rentals customer. I had a couple of cars from them and and, and bagged them for a job. And I was here on my working holiday, and so I got a, I got a job cleaning cars and, and making tea. Um, and, and that was my first my first role with Go. And and, and at, at that time, the business was was relatively small and a one small location in Penrose and Auckland with sort of a, a fleet of maybe 60 or 70 vehicles. So, you know, I've been there a long time and, and, and really enjoyed the, the, the incredible journey and, and growth and, and go, go uh, prior to COVID was, was probably the largest independent car rental company in New Zealand um, with a fleet of about 3,000 vehicles and staff of sort of about 150 in the, in the off season, but peaking at about 180 in the, in the summertime. So, you know, a reasonable sized business, and 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 really, what um, the, the the real springboard to our growth was probably getting on board uh, in, in the very early days of the dot com era, uh, and maximising the opportunity of, of digital. Um, you know, being very good with websites and e commerce and digital marketing, and really using that to springboard our growth. And as time went by, we we you know we we added more locations. What uh, starting in Christchurch. Not long after that in Wellington and a few years later in Queenstown and, and more recently in, in, in recent years, Dunedin. So, you know, Go's got a reasonable network now with six locations uh, across the country and, and uh, has grown the business. And, and in that time, there's been quite a, quite a huge, huge evolving uh, in terms, even in terms of products. So in the early days, we, we rented out, you know, Japanese imports that were imported out of, out of Japan, obviously cheap vehicles. And in and, and today's day and age, you know, we've got a full fleet of, of very modern vehicles with uh, with EVs and Teslas and, and other things uh, as part of the offering. So, you know, it goes evolved a lot over that time. And, and from my end, you know, it's been a, been a really, uh, really exciting journey, you know, into what's been, a, you know, a significant size business in, in recent years. And then obviously then, then COVID hit. So... Um, in response to the pandemic, for us, there was a, a, a focus that we called it the three P's. And, and those three P's were, were people, uh, plant being, being our vehicles and, and property. And those were the kind of the three core focuses in terms of downsizing the business. We knew we had to do that. COVID hit, bang. You can't just sit sit there with all, with all, the, with all the overhead. So we had to aggressively downsize the business. Um, the most horrific part of that was dealing with our, with our people and uh, I think we were, you know, we had to let 85 or 90 people go in, in, in that first round and, and many of those people who bled for go for many, many years. And as it turns out, in, in, the, in the whole sequence of things, the, t- the timing of that was actually, we were able to execute that quite quickly, but just the, the, the mental toll on me and everybody else in the business to have to go through that was just, it was, it was horrific. Uh, I'd, I'd never, never, ever want to have to go through that um, again. So... And then beyond that, then working through our fleet and doing what we needed to do to get our fleet down to a more manageable uh, number that would be fit for the domestic market. And that takes time. You can't just sell 2,000 cars and, and, they're, and they're all gone. So it takes time to trade through that and time to work through that. And we had the benefit of a relatively buoyant uh, used car market to help us through that process. And then last but not least really was, was property and, and working you know, with landlords uh, to, to achieve uh, rent abatement and rent support wherever we possibly could and, you know, sort of beg, steal, borrow to a point, you negotiate with suppliers and, uh, and and take up, you know, opportunities with IRD or whatever those situations might be. So, you know, we knew we had to make the business fit for domestic only. That's what we did. And hence, we shrunk everything right now. I think we now are at 68 people total in our, in our organisation. The fleet's just over a thousand. So that's that's really a summary. I hope I didn't go on too long, but maybe gives everybody a bit of a flavour of what we've had to go through in terms of um, the, the, the downsizing. No, I mean, uh, and actually, no, I do like the analogy of watching your, your house burn down. So it's a horrible thing to have to do. And I'm uh, going to you, Dan. I, I know, um, I suspect very much that uh, the story that James just told then is <laughs> not just an individual story. You know, uh, were there similar stories coming out of the Northcote, Birkenhead, Beachhaven uh, business community as well? Yeah, so uh, as a member of parliament at the time, um, you know, you, you get to deal with, you know, uh, lots of businesses and what they were dealing with during that first lockdown. And um, to build on what James was saying, I mean, yes, absolutely, both t- lockdowns have been tough, uh, the anxiety, um, the uncertainty. With the first lockdown, the uncertainty was very much related to, you know, simple things like what's an essential business? Am I an essential business? How do I become an essential business? How do I get support? Um, 
you know, concerns about the wage subsidy and not meeting the threshold requirements, being able to cover your commercial rent. So, you know, like James was saying, a lot of businesses struggling to deal with their commercial landlords and get an arrangement over that. Um, so that 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 came through quite quite clearly. I think the stats New Zealand indicates that about 1,000 businesses closed during that first lockdown. Um, and that doesn't, of course, uh, take into account the number of businesses that perhaps would have launched during that period, but also those businesses that perhaps didn't actually formally close from the company's office. But uh, certainly the impact from the first lockdown was felt, although there has been, of course, a recovery since then. This lockdown is very different. Uh, I'd be curious to get uh, other panellist perspectives on this issue as well. This lockdown, um, yes, it was very much a, we've tried and true methods of we've done this before, but also a sense of, oh, not again. Um, and for many small businesses, they've spent 2020 um, going through a lot of their capital. Uh, a lot of their um, you know, um, capital is gone. Uh, they've just got back to some sort of um, positive cash flow with respect to, you say, June this year and then having to go into lockdown. Um, many have had to actually go into their personal savings or uh, look to friends and family for uh, support. Um, so I do fear that uh, this lockdown, there'll be a, a massive fallout from this lockdown and, and whether there will be the um, kind of pent up demand. Uh, I think a lot of businesses are worried that that may not be the case with this lockdown. So a very, very uh, similar, um, but also different uh, impacts from both lockdowns. And res with respect to um, pivoting, I mean, there, there have been some really good stories of pivoting. I mean, I had one business in Northcote, MacVad, which is a plastics, um, they uh, manufacture plastic products for the kitchen in China and import, uh, and they successfully pivoted to selling and producing PPE. And um, that was really positive. Uh, there are also a lot of companies that, you know, for, you know, um, trying to find ways to make sure that they could open um, as an essential business. So, you know, for example, if you had a council contract, um, then you could actually still maintain um, operations in level four conditions. So people were thinking about how they could actually win business to, you know, with council to make sure that they could stay open. Um, but that's, again, you know, probably more of the exception rather than the norm. So, yeah, very interesting effects from the lockdowns, and it'll be interesting to see um, the effects from, from this one. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Um, Angela, I'm sure a lot of what Dan is speaking about then uh, certainly resonates with uh, your view, uh, as it were, from Queenstown. I mean, I, just, uh, <laughs> I was wondering if I'll just give a view from Queenstown and also kind of delve into, um, I suppose, the question, does it matter if Queenstown is open if Auckland and Australia isn't? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. So, um, I mean, our stories are definitely similar in that, that first lockdown, very stressful, very, you know, the fear of the unknown. Um, very naively, the second lockdown was announced just three days. And to be perfectly honest, most people in Queenstown and possibly around the rest of the country had been working their butts off for 18 months. And the idea of three days off sounded actually quite quite a great idea and then the reality that this was going to go on for longer and I think for us that's that is utter devastation for a lot of our businesses who are just hanging on so I guess Queenstown view is is similar to other parts of the country in that COVID hasn't affected every business equally um, until very recently, the construction industry in Queenstown, which is actually our second biggest industry, um, had been ticking over quite nicely. Um, our professional services obviously have done well, um, but the real story is in that tourism, hospitality, accommodation and activity sectors. So um, I don't think it would be an overstatement to say that um, they range from utter devastation to just hanging in, basically. Um, those that have survived have either had really deep pockets to fall back on, um, they've found alternative sources of income, 
or they've managed to hibernate part of their business or parts of their business. Um, but those are not options open to all businesses, especially smaller businesses. Um, so, I mean, to your question about does it matter about Auckland being open or not, um, just to give an understanding of the depth of uh, customers that Queenstown has lost, uh, usually we're 80 to 85% international tourists. So that's a huge tap being turned off on one day. Um, and then of the domestic 20 to 25% that we usually have, uh, a third of that is made up with Aucklanders. So you're taking a third of nothing, really, that we, we had. So um, they are pretty devastating numbers. As an example, um, the day the March lockdown was announced, one of our members emailed us to say that he had had $220,000 worth of cancellations that day. Uh, and so he'd looked into the resurgence payment and it came to about three and a half, four thousand dollars $4,000 um, which clearly doesn't even scratch uh, the surface of um, his devastation in a single day. So that's where we are. Mm. Uh, they're quite amazing figures. I mean, mm. and Julie, um, I suppose you can give us an idea of the struggles. I mean, Angela's mentioned the hospitality trade in Queenstown. Um, I mean, you can give us an idea of the struggles and, and, and I, in general. I mean, I'm just wondering as well. Have the struggles been different in um, the different geographical areas? And ha did that change from maybe the first lockdown to the second lockdown as well? Yeah. Um, so, look, let me start with the first lockdown. Um, if I can start actually with the top level numbers. So the hospitality and the accommodation sector represented $11 billion pre-2020. Uh, so what that meant in um, per day terms, when we went into lockdown first time, it was $40 million per day that um, we lost. And just keep in mind from our sector, we offer services. So that revenue is lost forever. Um, un unlike if you had a product that you could sit on a shelf, you could resell it down the line. Uh, and we have uh, within our industry uh, seasonal, so we had the winter, so those losses are permanent. You can't make them up by rebooking. You can't take a ski trip in summer, for example. So just really want to put that into context. Um, what's the difference this year is when we just did the numbers in the lockdown across New Zealand, we were burning $24 million as an industry. So that's um, just over $300 million, uh, again, has left our uh, industry and those losses are forever. So what the change is this time is that we didn't know what we didn't know last year like everyone. So you know, everyone lent in and they really dipped into their reserves and they went and extended and got more borrowings. Uh, what was uh, really good prior to the Auckland, no, sorry, the, um, the trans-Tasman bubble being shut, a lot of our business were businesses were feeding up to us to say that they're forecasting after this um, tourism season that they would have gone into the black. But now, like Angela uh, suggested, it's devastation to um, only glimmers of hope that they can hobble through. So, you know, what's happened is from a behaviour you, you touched on, what's different? So we've gone from what Angela said, an international market to a domestic market to a local market. Now, as the benchmarks, as everyone knows, to extend uh, to get uh the wage subsidy and the resurgence, you have to actually be operating at 40% down. Well, if you're operating as only at 60%, your business is not viable. That's just simple if you know, if we can just put that there. Now, what's actually happened, though, we do have winners. And uh, for no fault of them, you have a look at Auckland, we've got good operators with good venues in good locations or what they thought in CBD. That, that's going to take a long time to come back because there's this whole work from home um, shift and that's going to take a while to come back. So the suburbs are picking up um, off the back of the loss in the CBD. Then we have a look at geographical. The ones 
who weren't, like Angel said, Queen Sounds, uh, although they've got timber, you know, tourism was the number one uh, industry down there. They were highly reliant on tourism. However, if you look at the Manawatus who actually have, um, like, agriculture and so forth, they're doing okay. Uh, so we actually have this patchy and lumpy a scenario happening in the industry but the reality is we actually need to get open Auckland represents a third of our engine and without Auckland being opened the rest of the country in hospitality and tourism is really struggling and interesting we just did a survey what's changed behavioural wise off the back of the new short sharp lockdowns well it's obviously not um, short anymore what people are doing, they're, they're no longer uh, travelling on so much planes and in in one island, they're now just sticking within a three-hour drive scenario. So that's why I said we've gone from international to domestic to local. Yeah. So look, that's, that's where we are as an industry. However, what actually on the winners, the consumers are now on board with digital. Last year, we tried to do roll out digital apps to order from your table to the kitchen. They didn't have a whole lot of uptake there, but now it seems to be that digital um, consumer is, um, has, adoption has, has come. So that is... Um, uh, go to take silver linings where you can get them. So that's definitely a consumer behaviour that has changed that we can drive some uh, efficiencies through that. That's really interesting. I just want to um, I'll just kind of combine uh, a question of mine and something which has come through on the chat box. <laughs> and um, I mean, we'll probably open this to everyone, but you know, there's one question here that says, uh, do you think the government really understands the stress and strain going on at the coalface of New Zealand uh, small business? And I kind of uh, and link that into something else that you guys have been mentioning. And that was, you know, has it been sufficient as it were government health and government help, uh, government help for uh, business? I mean, I know that uh, there was consultants sent in to uh, or offered to help small business. And then I and so I was just saying, I'm going to open up to uh, Jimmy, if you want to have a quick thought, and then everyone else can uh, uh, can comment as well. And I think it's it's very easy to to to, to criticise what the government's done, and I, I think you know it's incredibly challenging managing through this whole COVID scenario. So, um, I, I, but I, but I do have my views. So I, I guess uh, I think I think at the moment we've got about a thousand small businesses a week closing their doors, and that's a thousand people's livelihoods going down the swanny. In some cases, people that have worked for 15, 20 years for that business, and 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 that's the the, the main income drive for them and their family. And and for me, that 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 simply isn't okay. And I, I don't I don't think that uh, any business should have to bear the brunt of that, given uh, you know government restrictions and lockdowns. I think that there's certainly a time and a place for consultants, but if you look at the, the total uh, amount of support across the various industries, I think there's been far too much spent on consultants. That's my personal view. For someone to come along and tell me what I already know, and, and you know, maybe goes slightly different in, in, in its size and, it, and, it, and it's got the, got, the, got, the, got the grunt to weather the storm, but for smaller businesses, they also know what they need to, what they needed was the cash to get through. And even the wage subsidy it doesn't doesn't get close to covering covering a, a, a normal wage that you're paying in your business. So you know, yeah, I mean, it, it's really difficult for the government, and and I think that there's, there's some parts that they've done incredibly well, and maybe other parts that they that they you know maybe could have tackled in it in a slightly different way. But I, I don't think the support has been enough. But I also think the support that has been targeted has been targeted in the wrong areas. That's that's my view. Yeah, I, I certainly would say the same about, say, the, as I mentioned before, the resurgence payment, you know, not even really scratching the surface of um, what their fixed costs are. I just thought I'd put in your brains, imagine, you know, the health and safety costs and the upkeep of our companies down in Queenstown who run helicopters or that have got boats on the lakes or in the fjords. And, um, I mean, their overheads are ginormous regardless of how many customers they're getting through the door every day. Um, and nobody wants to get on a helicopter that hasn't been maintained or whose, whose staff's health and safety training hasn't been kept up. Um, so, you know, those are the sorts of things. And as Jimmy said, you know, our feeling has been that that money's gone to consultants who have obviously done quite well through COVID. Um, and my thought was that, no consultant has the time in that $5,000 spend to really get to understand your business to a point where they can make valuable suggestions on how you can pivot because you as the business owner are going to know that 
the best to begin with. Um, and as Jimmy said, cash is king for, for a lot of these businesses who they borrowed absolutely as much as they can borrow. They've used their reserves and they're just out of cash. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah, Jimmy, um, no, no, I don't. And I think it does help um, if you have an understanding of small business, if you've worked in a small business or if, you know, you've, you've, you've had experience in small business. And I think with government, and whether it's the bureaucrats in Wellington or the politicians, many of them have never worked in a small business environment, so they don't understand what it's like to have to, you know, take care of paying your staff and and having the certainty or the uncertainty that goes with running a small business. So, you know, whether it's financial support, which we've touched on, or even simple things like providing enough certainty for business around how long lockdowns will, you know, will, will be and when can businesses start to plan, um, you know, to, to actually get back into operation. I think that that's the challenge is actually, you know, I think we should have a requirement in New Zealand that um, more politicians and people in Wellington actually have a small business background so that they can understand at the cold face what it's going on in the small business community. Yeah. yeah, I'll jump in here. We've been advocating. It's taken us 18 months, but um, yesterday it got passed through Parliament, the rent relief. So for those small businesses who don't have um, the 27.5 ADLS clause in their leases, that's going to be mandatory now. So there is a little bit of rent relief coming, um, but it took 18 months. Uh, cash is king like we've just spoken about, the wage subsidy, like Jane said, goes straight through to the employees and then you businesses have to pay on top of that. The resurgence package, um, only $1,500 for fixed costs. So with no income and accumulating fixed costs, to everyone's point, um, government has missed the critical point is around working capital. Um, when you're not open, you have zero income, so you have no working capital to pay these fixed costs. It's as simple as that. Yeah, it's an interesting question which has just come through. Um, it says, I've heard that one of the reasons why SMEs don't try to access financial relief from providers is that they're concerned about the impact on their credit, credit profile. Have you been hearing that in, in the industry? Take take that as a no. Sorry, Lynn. Uh, okay. Um, obviously, the the whole um, I mean, COVID is a uh, is a movable movable feast, and you know the government is, you know, trying to react as as best it can. And over the last, uh, I mean, <laughs> that's only our business. We drafted a uh, vaccination uh, policy about five weeks ago, and a week later it was out of date. So, and in the last uh, three days, four days, there's been a, a number of announcements around uh, vaccination. And now we now have mandatory vaccination. And I was just wondering, uh, certainly within Queensland and, and even within the, uh, you know, the, the wide, your wider industry, Julie, how is that going to affect you? What are your thoughts around that? I mean, it's, I mean, how hard is it for a business to actually implement that? So, Julia, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, look, we're working with government today on the detail because you're right, there's, there's a huge gap to gold on the detail on where does that start and stop because you've got a crossover on lots of legislations um, with mandating, you know, first of all, you've got your employment relations, then you've got your Bill of Rights, then you've got your work safe. So it's not just as easy as, oh, okay, the government said this will just do um so we're actually you know working with the policy team on what that actually means and like you were, like you were just saying a lot actually started this process but that's now voided because of this parliament act that it hasn't been written yet what will that look like um there that they'll actually have to take direction from there. So we're just waiting and see. So our advice is um, if you can just hold off until we actually understand the detail, um, because really it's one thing to, you will be allowed to ask your employees, are they vaccinated, for example, um, and they can be medically exempt, but you're not allowed to share that data with anyone else in the employee. So therefore, are you really allowed to say as a business, we are fully vaccinated? Because technically you're sharing personal information about each employee that works there. 
So there's all these crossover of legislations that we need to sort out and work with the government on that. It's really complicated. And then for no fault of the own, uh, for the owner, they will end up in legal proceedings, which is another cost. But it's also really stressful as well. So these, you're right, it's such a moving feast and these additional requirements are really stressful. They're really stressful for business owners. They're stressful for employees and they're stressful for customers. You know, Julia, I see that as a, as a genuine challenge for, for all businesses. Yeah. And, you know, uh, on the back of the announcement last Friday, uh, I'm still trying to work out what it means for Auckland's regional borders to start moving. Because in our business, my biggest market right now, which, and a bit similar to Angela's story earlier, without, without the overseas being previously the biggest market, you know, domestically, without Auckland moving, we're really struggling in, in, in other parts of the country. So the revenue tap is, is flowing, but it's it's not going fast if that makes sense so uh and all these extra areas to navigate are a genuine challenge and it's still it, it, a lot of time it just seems like there's an absence of a plan you know so what, what does it mean for Auckland getting traveling again okay we t- we're told we've got to get to 90 percent and we but what happens when we get to 90 we go straight into red but what happens to our borders and then going beyond that what happens with international borders so there's just many there's many things to navigate um, the, the vaccine situation that do we go with and, and this, this is, I think it's a it's a real minefield for businesses and yeah. you know in, in bigger businesses where you've got a number of people with, with big skill sets to work through these things it's still a challenge so in, yeah. in a smaller business with two or three people four people in the company you know the, the people must just be pulling their hair out yeah and what happens if we don't get to 90 percent well yeah, I think I think that's uh, distinctly possible in some parts of the country. It is, absolutely. Look, I can give you an update. We are working with government from the Auckland point of view, the Regional Business Partner Network. Um, we fed back specifically what was touched on earlier around consultants. So half of the money is actually carved off into doing. So we're actually advocating really strong that that money gets redirected to businesses to actually pay to do. So um, that piece of work hasn't been finished yet, but it's working. We're working with pace on that. Mm. Angela, I'm, I'm really interested just to understand a tiny bit more about about, about Queensland because obviously I've got a, a a business down there myself, you know, which is uh, also suffering on the fact that a you know international tourists and, and being my biggest market stuck in Auckland, but, but we're still open and doing things. But what, what's the what's the landscape down there at the moment? Genuinely, how are people faring? Uh, as I say, um, it's a game of two halves. So some are doing well and some aren't. But, um, you know, town's quiet. Uh, I mean, our council have taken the opportunity to do an enormous amount of work in town. So it's a little bit like a construction site. Um, so the, the vibe is different, um, you know, with only New Zealand tourists there. It's a, it's a very different vibe. Um it's all about this hanging on and and needing some certainty going forward. So some idea, because, you know, like I was talking to somebody the other day who said that if he'd known that it would have strung on this long, you know, he would have actually just shut his shop a year ago and waited for it all to go because he obviously he's spending his retirement money to keep him open. Um, so uh, that that's the difficulty is is the unknown and, you know, what, what's happening and, and no idea what, as you say, about the border in Auckland, what it actually means. We need a pathway, we need dates, we need a plan, and, and you know, and that's for domestic regional movement as well as international movement, you know. Well, we, we have no plan for international at the moment, so that's what we really need. Yeah. I think we've put some great stuff together, but uh, it, it certainly seems to be... Uh, in the too hard basket at the moment for the government, and they, they've got you know what, what's in front of them right now. So it's uh, it's a challenge. So mm. it would make life a lot easier for businesses if they understood how far they had to 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 hang in for. You can actually plan for it. If someone says right, you know, by Christmas everybody's going to be moving again, irrespective, and and by the end of March we're going to open the borders again. All of a sudden, people can plan and work towards yes. what's going on. I think that's probably the, the frustration that I that I see and that I hear from people in the industry. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, sorry, Don, are you going to? Yeah, no, I fully agree with James. Um, we're getting that uh, wherever, wherever I'm talking to in businesses in Auckland. Yeah. So I think, are we are we all going to be at headquarters on the 1st of December? Because I did read uh, they're going to be opening. Uh, I'll be uh, at, least, at least he's setting a date there. Um, 
So I just want to go back to uh, looking at, you know, we've talked about the number of uh, businesses that, um, that, have, that have, uh, have, have fallen over or failed. I mean, Dan, do you think uh, that some of these businesses were actually going to fall over anyways and maybe COVID has just quicken that demise or you know or do you get a feeling there's a lot of good business out there who've who've actually fell through uh, no fault of themselves and again, well, see, sorry, sorry and again are they failing this lockdown having you know, uh, survived the first one certainly in the after the first lockdown there were businesses that closed um you know reports for businesses that you know for lifestyle reasons people were getting out of the the game earlier than normal, so it was bringing forward their retirement plans. Um, there were businesses that closed that were already struggling, and this, and again, it just brought forward the demise of those businesses. Um, this lockdown, it's it's very different. As I said before, um, a lot of small businesses have gone through their cash that they've um, either spent in the first lockdown or um, built up over the last you know, year, they've gone through that, this lockdown. So they are really uh, scraping the barrel for support. Um, and so what you're going to see, I think, in the next uh, few months, and particularly in the uh, first and second quarter of next year, is a lot of genuinely good, profitable businesses that will struggle and uh, probably will close. So, um, you know, I think that's the difference between the lockdowns is, is just um, the capitalization of these businesses and the state that they're in um, now versus after the first lockdown. I'll jump in there too and just, uh, you know, all businesses have cycles. So, you know, some that cash reserves are high versus expenditure and, and, and for some this was just a matter of timing, you know, that they may have been a good or a bad business, which is not a great way to describe a business, but, you know, they may have been actually doing all right and if this hadn't happened would have been carrying on but they may have just experienced a large amount of expenditure or something like that. And that's a real shame to see them go because that's just part of the cycles of business. Um, and some businesses haven't even been open long enough to be able to be declared good or bad. Um, so that, you know, they haven't had the cash reserves behind them either. But this second lockdown, you know, certainly anybody that relies on tourists, um, the the debt's too high, you know, they've spent all any cash reserves they had um, and they're running out of options. Whether they're a good business or not, they need customers. So yeah. without customers, that's that's it for them. Yeah. I'll just jump in on one thing I'm hearing is the supplier side um, for the hospitality sector. So horticulture, for example, relies on the hospitality source to market up to 25 of their overall uh, revenue. So what I'm hearing now is the suppliers to our industry are also under a pressure point. So their terms of trade are not so flexible. So, you know, they're going to uh, require cash on delivery um, and without, as you said, customer without income, without working capital, that's going to create um, additional stresses. Uh, so, yeah, we have this huge multiplier effect um, in hospitality. And so we're really, um, uh, yeah, we're concerned about what that supply chain is going to look like. Yeah. Thanks I think the, in, in the tourism sector, there's, there's a number of uh, iconic and, and excellent businesses that have been genuinely uh, heavily affected, and, and, and you know, um, particularly where there's a, a strong reliance on on the international visitor, and, and you know, we were quite lucky in our business that we had a very, very strong domestic base that go. So it, 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 the, the change for us wasn't uh, insurmountable, but there, you know, many other businesses that were fully reliant on on international customers, and you know, think about the local guys running a, a, a tour company or something in Auckland, taking tourists around Auckland for a day trip. Well, you know, Kiwis aren't going to jump on that bus and pay to. Get Pay to go out to pee half of the day. They, they might rent a car for me and go do it themselves, but they're not. They're not going to go out with a tour guide around Auckland for the day. So, you know, how does someone like that survive in this situation, and and, and how do they pivot or what, whatever the want of a word is? So, I think um, I think that's really been the big challenge right across the tourism sector is the, the businesses they've been able to uh, to downsize and make themselves fit for the domestic market and have a domestic customer base. And there's a there's a, there's a subset of those businesses, but then. There's many that just were so reliant on international and, and through no fault of their own, you know, that they're, they're genuinely challenged to, to stay alive. And that's, that's, uh, it's devastating to see that. 
And I suppose on the other hand as well, and Dan mentioned it earlier on about we've probably seen a lack of new business because I presume it's going to be harder to get any working capital or lending from a bank with a uh, with a really good idea in the well in, in your sectors. And for, for I mean, Julie, what, what does what does um, what, what does the viaduct look like in, in six months from now? I mean, if we, is it going to be like Queen Street with tumbleweeds coming down and, and four leaf signs four leaf signs on all the shops and the windows? And I mean, you know what. What do, what are our cities and the hearts of our thriving urban centres? What do they look like in 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 a few more months when many businesses have have disappeared and then all of a sudden what what's the offering that New Zealand's got on a global basis? I, I, that what really worries me. That really does worry me. Yeah, you're right. So I speak to government about that all the time. You you got that broken window scenario um look to put on global events to attract so we've got fifa women's world cup coming up and all the planning's happening so we actually have to deliver also a global product but what i touched on earlier is you've got good operators with good venues in good locations in the urban like in the cbd but because of this continuing working from home that is problematic and around the survivability of a lot of those venues so how do they keep and like like you said it's no fault of their own this is not because they're bad operators it's how do they pivot from from that how do they can't dra drag those customers in the suburbs back into their venue uh, so how long will this trend continue and so therefore as a business owner how long do you stick with it and that's that uncertainty Yeah, yeah. Just um, we've spoken a lot about the um, the financial implications, uh, and we did mention stress. I'm just uh, wondering if you no, know, have you uh, have you seen a a, a rise and up tick in your members or your staff or the people who you may uh, advise uh, having uh, more mental health issues and. And if so, now what, what what are you doing? Uh, how are you assisting them in that in that in, in that area? So um, I'll start with you, Julie. Uh, I'm really concerned with the mental health and well-being of our business owners. Um, you know, it's it's not good out there. Like it's been touched on, these are lifelong careers. People have had really successful, you know, for no fault of their own, and they've done the right thing. They've dipped into their savings. They've remortgaged their houses. And, you know, with Auckland being locked down, you know, remember it went from short, sharp to we're one more week, we'll review it, to now it's every two weeks we'll review it um you know we had last year about you know we're going to come back strong you know we have we're quite a resilient uh industry but now the, all the wind is out of their sail um look we have a regional branch network that we connect um and we have little subgroups that we connect locally uh but this is one thing we're working with the government on a mental well-being piece for business owners. Uh, the stress is real um, and it's growing and I'm extremely concerned about what I'm hearing, uh, what's happening out there. We're similar in Queenstown. You know, unfortunately, though, you know, we've been offering mental health workshops or one-on-ones and, you know, there has been support offered and the uptake has actually been really poor. And when questioned about it, a lot of the business owners just said, we don't, I don't have the time, like I'm, I'm so under the pump, um, that actually the ability to take time out to attend those things just isn't there at the moment, which is very concerning. Yeah, m many business owners I talk to are, are at a breaking point. Um, and I, I agree with everything that's just been said. You know, business closures are up 14% from last year. Um, people are people are just at a breaking point. And it's not just <clears throat> it's not just the fact that they don't have the certainty, they don't have the um, income coming in. But it's also the um, you know the the, the lack of um, a sense of being able to have autonomy and um, have have your own steer over how your business is performing, and um, I think that's going to be a massive issue. I'm not, you know, it'd be curious on programs that are being effective at the moment. I, I wonder if there is um, such programs that would be because we, we we need to step that up. It's going to be a big issue uh, now, and also once um, we're out of lockdown and. 
uh, in that recovery phase. Yeah, the, the recent mental health awareness week was a was a was a good process, and I know it, internally our HR and comms teams did a, a really great job to get to share that with, amongst our teams at, at, at Go and have everybody involved in that on a daily basis. So certainly from a, from a business that I wouldn't say is thriving, but we're surviving. Um, you know, we, we we took the opportunity to really engage in, in that particular week, and I was also involved in a in a webinar with, with, with other industry people as well on, on that particular matter. Certainly, internally for us, we, we continue to maintain uh, counselling services for, for for our people, and, and we've been able to pro- provide that through uh, through EAP. So, I think you know, if if you do um, have the opportunity to put those things in place for your people, you certainly should. Um, but again, not all businesses can afford to do that. But the other thing that people can do is they can promote the the many very, very good free services that are out there. So, you know, I'd encourage um, you know business owners or, or or anybody who's you know to be able to share that information with, with their teams and with their people to to help people get through. But um, yeah, it, it, it's it's a real challenge, and uh, I think the biggest thing the government could do right now is actually go out with some dates and go right here. This is the date for domestic. This is the date for international. And then everybody can go. Cool. I've now. I know. I now know what I've got to do. I've got. To, I've got to work for the next three months to keep myself alive, and I'm. And I'm good, or whatever it might be. I, I think we need a. We need a plan. We need a date. We need a runway, and then. And then everybody can get on with it. This. This, this whole holding pattern and, you know, waiting, waiting, waiting. It's. It's, it's just mind numbing. Yeah, I agree. The other thing as well, I mean, um, you, you, you kind of um, segued into what we can probably discuss for the last uh, remaining part of this uh, uh, of this uh, discussion. You know, is around how does uh, New Zealand recover? And, you know, is there a silver bullet? And, you know, what further assistance is needed? Now, you t- we're all talking about a you know, one the best thing we could do if we actually had you know, a timeline. But... Even if we open up the borders, you now have we missed a trick in the last eighteen months? Because will you know, your average Kiwi loves to travel? So if the borders open, does that really uh, save you, or will they just be off to Europe and the Pacific? <laughs> I'll jump in here because I'm actually really concerned we're going to be left behind globally and um, we need to get going on this and it actually starts with our talent. You know, there's a global war of talent on and that is hugely concerning me. So from a hospitality sector and James, you know, to, you actually need people. Um, so we've we've lost 30% of our labour force in the hospitality and accommodation sector. So we used to employ 170,000 people. We actually need people to open our business. Um, and literally, we will be in a scenario that we won't be able to fully trade seven days a week because we're going to be limited on a reduced uh, labour force. Uh, I think that's actually problematic. And I think this is the stuff that the government should actually be looking at. Australia is is nailing us um and they're obviously opening up is it the 8th of, of november uh and they're opening up all visa workers as well um so we're going to get a drain that our people will move over there because it's just easier that's i'm really concerned about that yeah. from, a, from a tourism point of view um so we're in a position at the moment where our, our offshore partners are seriously questioning whether they continue to hold New Zealand product in their brochures, as an example. So we're hearing that from lots of offshore partners that have sold New Zealand for many, many, many years, and there's some real genuine risk there from a tourism perspective. But the moment that starts happening, then the airlines cut the routes, and and then it's years and years and years of of, of planning and hard work to get those things operating again. So I think that's that's definitely an incredibly important piece that we need to try and uh, maintain through in, in the coming weeks and months because I, I think New Zealand's reputation is 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 starting to, to suffer a little bit globally. But we, we do have the the benefit of an incredible brand. Brand New Zealand is very, very strong around the world. So I do think when the international borders open, there will be pent-up demand. And the New Zealand story is still quite strong in terms of managing COVID um, globally, I think. So, you know, it's not it's not all doom and gloom, but uh, but there's gen- generally like like you, Julie, I've got some concerns there. Yeah, when you think back to last year, this time last year, I mean, we, the debate was about how New Zealand could leverage its COVID-free status, and when you look a year on, you kind of think, well, that's been a lost opportunity uh, for New Zealand, and, and I 
shield the concerns that have been uh, pointed out. Uh, migrant workers, we've lost tens of thousands of people that have been here um, just through a lack of processing immigration uh, visas. Uh, MIQ has been an absolute debacle. So we absolutely need that plan for how long these lockdowns will last, a plan for re-engaging with the world. Uh, and I acknowledge the government certainly trying to do that, but uh, we need to get down to specifics, like James said, dates um, and movements that people can start to plan with. And, um, yeah, so that we can welcome tourists back, we can welcome uh, students, international students back. That's a $5 billion industry for New Zealand. Uh, so, you know, I think we're probably playing catch up with, res with respect to the rest of the world, but we can still, I think, if we move quickly enough, um, come back and recover quickly um, as a result. Just, most, just, sorry, Angela, but most importantly, we all want to connect with Farnow again. Yeah. Wherever they are in the world, Australia, UK, whatever, we all want to do that. That's, yeah. you know, that's a key. Well, I was just going to pick up on a few points there where we said um, the, the data is telling us that there is pent up demand. However, you know, as the rest of the world is opening and we still have no date, people are planning their holidays. And those holidays obviously are not including New Zealand, which is problematic. But also to pick up on Julie and Jimmy's points, with the lack of staff, good staff, um, brand New Zealand is at risk. So, you know, there's all talk about these uh, high value tourists. Well, if they're going to come and they're going to expect a certain level of service, they may not get that service because we don't have the staff uh, at that high level to be able to offer it. And then that they go back and tell their stories. So our brand is at risk of um, being degraded by the lack of staff, uh, quality hospitality and tourism staff in the country. So that I think there's a, a real problem there. For us, we've looked at um, the Kickstarter fund that is, is sitting there in the government and the, the bureaucrats seem to be waiting for an opening date of our borders to be distributing that money. But we're pushing quite hard to see that money go out now to small businesses because there's no point in waiting. There will be no small businesses to kickstart if we continue to wait and hold on to that money. So we'd like to see that pool of money that's been sitting there um, start to be distributed to small businesses so that when the borders do open, we may actually have something to offer people. Julie, just a quick quick question for you that you'll get a, you'll have a grip on. This is something I'm really interested in. How was the sector coping with 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 domestic on its own? So how was the sector coping with no international? Well, look, it was patchy and lumpy, as I suggested. I hope you mentioned Julie. Sorry, I'm just jumping in. Um, you know, uh, there was no one particular trend. However, on the whole, we had adapted. We were finding the new norm. And um, having the Australian bubble was definitely beneficial. However, we've just recently, and there's a global report on well-being uh, around people need to connect. Fundamentally, we're social creatures. So people actually need to connect and what's happening and they're, they're finding their connection through hospitality venues. So in actual fact, the survivability of our industry is strong. We just need the business owners to hang in there for them to open for or open up when we can freely trade again. That is the problem, to James' point. Give us a date. So whether we need to hibernate until that date, that might be a scenario. Um, so I actually think that we, we saw a huge sugar rush last year, but we're not seeing it this year. It's actually about 25% down. But we're actually in a domestic environment. Hospitality, so food, beverage and accommodation is definitely survivable. The accommodation is probably harder hit. You're most likely to go out and have a meal, get a coffee with your friends or celebrate an occasion as opposed to go away for multiple accommodation nights and tourism attractions. So we're seeing that at a greater risk. We, we saw similar in Queenstown where, you know, Queenstown is still a, a bucket list destination for New Zealanders even. So a lot of New Zealanders took the opportunity, you know, accommodation was cheaper, the activities are cheaper. It was a great time to come, but it's almost like they've ticked that off their list now. Um, and so, you know, the flow of domestic tourism isn't quite what it was last year. Mm. 
It's always amazed me there's not been enough MIQ beds, yet there's hotels with just the occupancy. I, I scratched my head on, on that one particularly. Um, yeah. I, I did also want to just say, I know it's been very doom and gloom, this conversation, and, and you know, Queenstown is, um, it is a problem, but I do know the Queenstown businesses are resilient people, you know, they're very entrepreneurial, um, they've been a boom-bust um, scenario for a long time, so, you know, I really commend the resilience of a lot of Queenstown business owners, I think, you know, a lot of kudos goes to them because they do feel quite ignored nationally, but, um, you know, as a community, we're wrapping around and supporting. So I just wanted to have that on the record. I think uh, that's not a really good uh, point to end on before we go. Uh, and the fact that, you know, that even, even there, as we have spun a lot of doom and gloom, there have been the talks about the resilience and also talks about some few, you know, kind of golden nuggets uh, in the future. So um, before I pass on um, to uh, Graham, I'd like to... Uh, thank you all for uh, taking time to uh, come on uh, and uh, discuss this. So I will now pass over to uh, Graham from Astron to give the vote thanks. Uh, thanks, Rob. And look, we're um, Astron Light's really proud to be um, supporters of the FSC. And uh, just a huge thank you to the panellists for sharing your insights on the reality of, of business in New Zealand today. I, I, I must admit it, it was rather sobering um, listening to the, to the feedback. And um, clearly there's a huge amount of pain and, and probably what's even more uncomfortable is the uncertainty um, for business owners. And I think, Julie, one of the first comments that you made was um, you were moving from, a, I think you said, a light in a tunnel to being standing in front of a freight train. And I think for a lot of small business owners, and I think we can't, um, we, we should always remember that the SME market makes up about 40% of the workforce in New Zealand. And, you know, um, if, if you've got businesses failing, then, you know, that is going to have huge impacts right across the, the whole economy. Um, but at the same time, um, James, um, your opening comments um, are really heartening. And, you know, even though it's been, it's clearly been a struggle and it's been really difficult, but to see a business adapting in this sort of COVID environment and actually and, and succeeding is, is really um, great to hear. And I, I think, you know, from just listening as you would, everyone was talking about the, 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 the impacts around New Zealand, I was just thinking about the insurance industry and we're sort of seeing similar trends, you know, particularly with advisory businesses. And I think, Julie, you mentioned this, you know, embracing digital technologies. And we're sort of seeing advisory businesses now who their traditional business was always face to face are now engaging through um, digital technologies, um, not only communicating with clients, but generating leads. So, yeah, look, it, it does. It is quite sobering, and uh, um, but it is good to hear that there is, you know, there is glimmer of hope out there. And I think that's one thing we've just always got to um, hang on to. Um, Richard um, and the FSC, huge thank you for putting on these events. They are just so worthwhile. And again, finally to the panelists, um, thank you for sharing um, your insights into the businesses and the segments that you represent. So thank you. Mm -hmm.